All right, and welcome everybody to our pickup webinar for November 28th, uh, we, 2023. Um, we are excited to hear from Hannah Kramer, who is an undergraduate student at Western Kentucky University. Uh, she is a pre-service teacher looking to go into high school physics. Um, she's gonna talk to us about frame shifting for student success in physics classroom coding. Um, so Hannah's going to talk to us for a few minutes here, and then, as usual, we'll open the floor for questions and tangential conversations afterwards. So Hannah, go ahead whenever you are ready. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. So to start off, you kind of introduced me already. Uh, I'm an undergraduate student here at uh, Western Kentucky University, and I've been working for the past a uh, little over a year now with my advisor, Dr. Scott Bonham, to improve our uh, vPython curriculum in university physics here at Western Kentucky University. And so I'm going to start off with some background. Uh, here's a little outline of what to expect for the rest of the webinar session. Um, but here at WKU, and you might have run into similar problems at uh, your university or school, is uh, we've run into a number of challenges trying to integrate the Python uh, into our physics curriculum. And this started several years ago as part of implementing matter and interactions. Um, here at WKU, our primary population of students in university physics are engineering, uh, engineering students and gifted high school students that are part of what's get, known as Gatton Academy here. Uh, and two of the most common difficulties have been that students struggle to combine new physics skills with new coding skills. And students also lack confidence and motivation when it comes to these new Python activities. Uh, and the primary focus of this piece of my research and uh, this webinar is the aspect that students are struggling to combine physics and coding skills. And so we initially hypothesized that these issues were primarily caused by cognitive overload. Uh, when students are learning new physics principles at the same time as new coding skills, it can be a lot all at once. Um, and not only was this something that we had thought ourselves, but uh, my advisor, Dr. Bonham, had had a conversation with Ruth Shabai, one of the authors of Matter and Interactions, uh, about GlowScript and the use of vPython. And she had hypothesized that students were experiencing cognitive overload uh, when working through these coding activities. And so to initially address this hypothesized cognitive overload, in the fall of 2022, we implemented some interventions into three experimental sections of our university physics uh, one lab. And university physics here consists of a lab component and a lecture component. Um, but our focus here was on the lab and our lecture meets uh, for four, day, four days a week, it uh, has approximately um, 50 students in the class and students sit at active learning tables. Whereas our lab is more typical with the workbenches that students uh, sit at work with a partner, uh, but we have integrated vPython activities where students simulate what they're doing in uh, lab physically. They do a simulation of that in vPython as well. And so our first intervention that was implemented to help reduce this cognitive overload uh, hypothesis was the addition of pre-lab questions. A lot of times the students were only seeing vPython once a week in lab at, at a minimum, and this wasn't quite enough for them to really pick up on the notation and not be learning it again and again, week after week. And so, we implemented these pre-lab questions just as a way to help familiarize students with the Python notation and also address common mistakes made by students. And then our second intervention was, uh, like I said, the students are simulating 
um, the lab experiments in vPython as well. And so when they're moving to code, they have a starter code that looks like that picture on the right side of the screen. These students were, uh, instead of just hopping into code like we had them do in the past, we provided them guides in their lab manuals that look like the image on the left, where students were translating, uh, they were beginning with algebraic expressions for the physics principles and then translating to code rather than trying to do everything all at once. And the hope was that this would also reduce some of that cognitive overload that we had hypothesized. And so while we had hoped that these interventions would have a large effect on improving student success and confidence with vPython, um, our data was impacted by a different finding. It wasn't super clear how successful these interventions were because there was such a big difference between students with and without prior coding experience that our data was primarily overwhelmed with this. Uh, you can see on the left when students were asked uh, how confident they were in their ability to complete the Python assignments approximately a month into instruction, only one student without coding experience agreed with the statement. Um, additionally, when it came to asking students what they had learned the most from, over half of the students without this coding experience had stated either nothing or I don't know, uh, so they couldn't even come up with something that they had learned the most from. And so clearly these interventions that we implemented didn't appear to be enough. And so we piloted some new activities in lecture the following semester. And so I have a little activity uh, that I expect to take 20 to 25 minutes going through one of these activities that was particular, su particularly successful that the students participated in. But before we move into this activity, I have a different question to pose. So we have this word cloud here on Mentimeter. You can either scan the QR code or uh, join at this number up here. Um, you can still all see the screen okay. Um, but if you could respond to the question, how would you respond to a student who asks for a simple definition of power? And I'll give you another minute or so to go ahead and get your responses in.
Okay, so it seems like most of you chose to say something along the lines of rate of change of energy, energy per time, something along those lines. But what if I told you this student was actually asking for definition of power for a political science class or a social studies course? Um, so you may or may not have noticed that you framed or interpreted this question in a certain way assuming that it was in a physics context when it might not have actually been physics related at all. And so let's go ahead and put a pin in this, but we will come back to this after the activity. So switching back over to my PowerPoint. So we have this activity here. Um, of, like I mentioned, one of the activities that we have implemented in our University of Physics One lecture course. Um, we will be um, implementing breakout rooms so you all can work collaboratively. Can you copy that? Yeah. You put actually copy the actual text and put that in the chat. It looks like room three is still wrapping up. There's always that one room. <laughs> In pandemic time, I would break up my uh, my online labs with breakout rooms and the first group that finished freed everyone else. <laughs> oh, that's clever. They had to explain what they did too to get the uh, you know to finish the class. <laughs> All right, Hannah. Looks like everybody is back, and we are back to recording. Yeah, so now that we have gone through an a sample activity, uh, we can switch back into uh, discussing framing in a little more detail, and also our spring twenty twenty three and fall twenty twenty three interventions. So much like the activity you all just worked through, uh, we had five activities that we had piloted in uh, well this past spring. And these activities all followed a similar format to our lab manual guides and the activity you just walked through where students start with those algebraic principles and then translate to code. Um, and they also have students adjusting initial conditions in their code, for example, uh, you can see this bottom left uh, image is from a code that they did of the moon orbiting the earth. And so they changed initial conditions like the radius or the mass of the moon. Um, and so even though we had implemented several of these activities, some of them seem to be more successful than others with that energy assignment you all just worked through being one of our most successful assignments. And the reason we believe this assignment was uh, more successful than others was due to uh, its usage of frame shifting and uh, utilizing both physics frames and coding frames and uh, finding synergy between the two. Now, what I mean by framing is that framing is how we make sense of what it is that we are doing. Uh, to move to this slide, so if we, T take our pin out of that word cloud activity I had you all uh, participate in earlier. You all had framed the activity as being a physics activity. So you're accessing all your physics knowledge and ignoring potentially other definitions of power. Uh, similarly, students frame uh, coding assignments or uh, activities in vPython as being either physics, coding, or both, but based off of how the student is framing the activity affects the tools they bring to the table. 
So if the student thinks that it's just a coding activity, they're only going to be accessing their coding. So as you can see in this image. Um, and then an article by Conlon and others had actually noted that um, their ass assignments were the most successful or students were the most successful with the coding assignments when there was a clear synergy between doing physics and doing code. And a particularly or a particular instance of this is when students are participating in a debugging process, uh, much like the energy activity, since you have to think about whether it's a physics issue or a coding issue, or it could be both. And so students are having to think about both uh, areas of knowledge. And so when we had analyzed our uh, student work from the spring semester, we noticed there was a huge difference between two activities in particular, uh, one being a pendulum assignment and one being the assignment you all just worked through. The pendulum assignment had kind of cut off physics and coding by having a title quite literally labeled analyzing the physics. And so students, even though out of, uh, there were six groups that worked together on this activity, all groups except one had a properly working code Four out of six of the groups were giving incorrect statements of how changing initial parameters would affect the motion of a pendulum. For example, changing the mass or changing the length of the pendulum. They were giving incorrect ideas, even though they had the correct code in front of them. So they were kind of frame shifting away from physics or frame shifting to physics away from the tool they had right in front of their eyes. Meanwhile, our activity that you all worked through had an emphasis on debugging, um, which was something Conlon and others noted as a time where frame or a time where synergy and success for students is really uh, high. And so this activity, all of the students had properly functioning code and only had minor issues on their assignments, like uh, miswriting notation, even though they had it right in their code. Uh, they might have used like a carrot instead of the double asterisks for notation in view Python. And so this past um, semester, or I mean this current semester, we have been working to revise our assignments and dive a little deeper into how students are actually working on the assignments. And so using slightly revised versions of the assignments, um, we implemented them this semester and also had a pullout a group of students that would work on an identical version of the assignment in a separate classroom. And I'd usually pull out three students. And the, the reason for this was because I was having them participate in a think aloud procedure. And it could sometimes be a little uh, quiet in the classroom itself. And also so I could focus on one group. Uh, that's why we were pulling them aside. But I had this observation protocol every two minutes, I would write down whether the students were focused on code or physics, whether they were um, focused on mixed or mixed coding in, in physics or none of the above, whether they were looking at their screens or focused on the worksheet, uh, whether they were in discussion with students or uh, asking questions off task, et cetera. And so from these observation protocols, I looked at revised versions of the assignment. I'm still uh, in the process of analyzing data from the new versions of the assignments. Uh, like I mentioned, the four out of six students having the incorrect uh, statements for the initial parameters being changed with the pendulum assignment. Uh, so these graphs here are kind of upper bounds for the pendulum assignment. Um, since these were with the slightly revised version uh, of the assignment, but you can see that while the amount of physics frame and coding frame is equal in each case with 40% and 40% for the pendulum assignment and 30% and 30% for the energy assignment, uh, the big difference between the two is the amount of mixed frames uh, with the energy assignment doubling the amount of time where students had this synergy between the two frames. Uh, and so, we believe this is why our energy assignment was much more successful. And so, as you can see, successful assignments require more than just balance between physics and coding. 
they also seem to uh, require that synergy between the two frames. And so to move into just a little bit of framing breakdown of the activity you all participated in. So uh, looking at the time, instead of having you all frame each step of the activity, I'm going to walk through how I had uh, framed it and kind of explain my thought process behind them. And so starting with uh, the first page of the guide, uh, unrelated to whether it's physics or coding frames, we always began each assignment with a purpose statement so students could see uh, how the assignment they were working on was actually connected to the physics they were learning in class. Uh, but this first block you can see was coded. Uh, so blue is the physics frames and yellow is the coding frames. And that uh, first algebraic expressions block uh, fits under physics frames and students are primarily focused on just writing down expressions. And then the next box has students translate to code framed, or as a coding frame in gold. And then on our next page, the graphing process is primarily a coding frame since students are uh, pretty much just focused on the syntax side of things. How do, how do I do a graph in VPython and that kind of thing. And then they move into running the program. Uh, which that can require thinking as as they're seeing, does this make sense? They're starting to realize um, that some they're sometimes starting to begin that debugging process of hmm, something looks off, just like you all seem to be doing when your total energy wasn't uh, conserved. And so moving to steps uh, twelve and thirteen, this is where the students would be comparing their results to their expectations, going back to a physics frame. But then when they move into identifying that error, this is where the debugging goes in and they're focused back on physics and coding frames. And then on our next page, we're mostly walking through student, uh, walking the students through the trade-offs between um, numerical error and the speed of your program uh, fitting under a coding frame. And then we have students test their ideas to reduce error once again, fitting under that debugging process where they're uh, having synergy between those frames. And then on this last page, we have the students um, seeing these computational advantages when they're um, able to use their code to do calculations quicker than they would be able to by hand which is kind of integrating those two frames. And then finally, uh, just identifying where max the maximum kinetic and potential energy occur fitting under physics. And then this is just a little roadmap of the stages of the assignment uh, going from physics frames, coding frames, and areas of synergy between the two. Um, and so this just shows that the Integration between doing physics and doing code are very important for student success and not just uh, having physics and coding, but having the two uh, synergistically combined. And so if anyone has any questions or any discussion they'd like to lead into, happy to. Thank you very much, Hannah. Let's please take a minute to uh, express our gratitude to Hannah in the chat or visually on your screen. And yeah, we have uh, the floor open for questions. <laughs> so I think this is super engaging. I like it a lot. Um, I'm curious to know, um, do you grade this? Do students get a grade for doing this work or? Or do they do it as part of their course load uh, without any grade? Uh, so I personally don't do the grading, but the professor for the course does take this as a grade. Uh, I know this semester, though, she said she hasn't been too harsh with the grading, um, but uh, more so if they seem to be getting the general process, uh, she's still give some relatively high grades, isn't super harsh about it. But.
Uh, T. Kelly, then Bruce after that. All right, thanks. Uh, yeah, great presentation. Um, I did see you had a survey question at the end of that for <laughs> students to kind of self-assess themselves. I'm just curious. I know it's just one number that they're really circling, but mm -hmm. where did they land? Um, and was that in, um, did that agree with your breakdown uh, of those pie charts you showed us about the breakdown of your assessment of where they spent their time? So uh, that survey question is something I haven't uh, dived super deep into analyzing quite yet, uh, but that is an so, like I said, I had them in the break, or the three students in the separate room. So I had individually coded those students, uh, but the survey question was given out to the class as a whole. Um, so I am planning on going through this soon to see how that data matches up. That's why I hadn't uh, explained that part in detail in the presentation, but definitely something I plan on looking into. But I know uh, one interesting thing I did notice just from glancing at the students in uh, my sessions were um, some of the students that had the prior coding experience were circling um, mostly physics or leaning towards that side, whereas the students that lacked the coding experience were kind of leaning towards the other side. But that's just from small numbers of what I have noticed so far, not very systematic analysis yet. All right, uh, Bruce, go ahead. Uh, don't forget to unmute, Bruce. <laughs> OK, that might be better. Um, I want to share something that Ruth Shabai did in recent years of her teaching that was very successful um, and is related to everything we've been talking about today. She established from the very beginning of the semester that uh, VPython would be for the students a very useful tool and that they should put away their calculator. And so, and she did various things, which are, I'll come to in just a moment. But the idea was to have them be using it a lot, a lot of time on task. One of the problems she had had in previous places in earlier times was the students only rarely were actually using VPython. Maybe it was like once every other week in a lab or something. But she encouraged them to use it as a tool when doing homework. And she made it stick in an interesting way. Uh, first of all, encourage, use this instead of a calculator. It'd be a lot easier to do your vector calculations this way. <laughs> Secondly, in the classroom when she was lecturing, and in a situation where in the past she would have gone to the blackboard to work out the algebra to get an answer, she used to be Python instead. And the students could see various important things like, it's okay to make mistakes. I'm an expert and I make mistakes. Don't feel embarrassed. And they got very good at spontaneously saying, hey, you've made a mistake on line three. This is all golden. It also emphasizes um, variables. On a, she encouraged them on exams to submit uh, on a VPython program instead of the usual kind of written solution. Their written solutions typically do not use variables or are unreadable. And when she got these VPython programs for the proof of something, she could easily run that program and see, oh, they just lost a factor of two here, minus one, instead of it's wrong. But if it had just been written out without variables, whatever, it's almost hopeless to figure out where they've gone wrong. You just don't have the time for it. So all of those things contributed to large time on task, even if it was not very great, maybe it's just A equals five, and A equals three, what's A times M? And so it had a big impact, and it's obviously extremely easy to implement.
Yeah, those are some really excellent points. I, I know right now as an undergrad, I obviously don't have uh, control over that much implementation of vPython, but I am wanting to implement vPython into my future high school classroom. And a lot of those ideas are some that just discussing with other um, colleagues at AAPT and PERC this, this summer. I had heard that using vPython as a calculator and that kind of thing is just implementing it into more things in your classroom can be very helpful. I find it ironic that it's the availability of computers that gets students to use variables and symbols, whereas they didn't use to use symbols at all. Ironic. <laughs> Hannah, did you also think about um, collecting data on students' physics background? You obviously disaggregated your data on coding experience. Um, I wonder if there might be a similar effect with high school physics experience that that frees them up to focus more on the coding implementation. Yeah, we hadn't specifically looked at that in a, um, what sort a like, for research purposes, we've had separate stuff we can do departmentally, and I have access to that data in that sense, but that's not stuff included on our IRB to be able to publish data on. Um, but that would definitely be a, a good thing to look into more in future um, studies, yeah. We are uh, just past our usual uh, stop time of one hour. Um, I am happy to keep the Zoom open. I know pickup folks uh, like to engage in lengthy conversations on this stuff. Uh, but if folks need to head to bed or get ready for their classes tomorrow morning, uh, we definitely appreciate everybody attending. And uh, I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Sometimes that also generates additional conversation <laughs> question that uh, folks don't usually have recorded. But uh, thank you again, Hannah. We really appreciate your time and uh, congratulations on this excellent work. Well, thank you for having me.